Toss aside the touchy-feely notions of love in business and recognize the real power it holds. Welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast with host Steve Farber, drawing on his work with a wide variety of companies from the Fortune 100 to smaller family-owned businesses. Farber shares inspiring interviews with business leaders and proven strategies for how you can create experiences that your customers will love by developing a culture that your employees, teammates, and colleagues love working in. Discover why and how love at the end of the day is just damn good business for you too. Here's your host, Steve Farber. Hi, this is Steve Farber, and welcome to another episode of the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. You can watch the entire episode, you can listen to it, you can read the transcript of the whole damn thing at stevefarber.com forward slash podcast. I invite you to come and pay us a visit online. My guests today have been on the show before. They are the brothers Corin, Isaac and Torald. So a little bit about them uh, before we dive in, but I just want to give you a, a heads up that you are about to hear something that has, well, certainly never happened on this podcast before. And I bet it hasn't happened too often anywhere in the universe. I'm not going to tell you any more about that, except that it will be a, a spontaneous creative expression right here on the spot. And these guys are the embodiment of creative expression. They're world-class musicians. They've traveled with Pink, toured with Coldplay. They've opened for Rod Stewart, Bon Jovi. I mean, these guys have, have been around uh, the musical world, and they are absolute geniuses when it comes to collaborative creation, co-creation. You know, the collaborative process is something that's on everybody's mind. We all want our teams to be more collaborative. We want our companies to be more collaborative. We know that there's a power of creativity that happens in the collection of human minds if we just learn how to do it. And that's what we're going to talk about today, along with a little bit of uh, music to um, brighten your day. So have fun, join us in this great conversation and a little bit of a concert with the Brothers Corin. Enjoy. Isaac and Torold, welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. This is your, uh, this is an encore appearance from you guys. Yes, indeed. Farbsy, Thank thanks for having us. Yeah, great to see you again. I love that you call me Farbsy. You know. My, you know, my favorite, you know, I've, I've been on, um, I've been on a last name basis with people for a long time. Uh, had I had you know Tom Peters on the on the podcast recently? He was one of my mentors, and and he he comes right out of the gate, Farber, hey Farber, 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 and uh, then he then he had to explain why he calls me Farber. <laughs> but you guys call me Farbsy. Farbsy, it's an Australian thing. Yeah. You, you have to shorten it and add an e to it. Just yeah. it brings it closer yeah. and makes it very or an endearing. O. Or an O, right? Yeah. Farber, but Farbsy just stuck. Yeah. I don't know. It yeah. wouldn't Farber. Yeah. No, I had to vote. I'd, I'd, I'd choose the Farbsy over the Farbo. There you go. Farbo makes me sound like like I'm about 800 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> haven't, haven't been out of bed for 20 years. It really does. Second, the second part is, is almost true. <clears throat> uh, I haven't been out of this chair in, in yeah. you know a year. <laughs> that's why we are standing right now with you to take a break from sitting. Really, so we, that's I a think... really good idea. That's really, But the pro see, I can't do that because as you guys know, I think I've shared this with you before. I don't wear pants. <laughs> I, I, uh, I mean, I wear, you know, I wear workout shorts and that kind of a thing. But, um, you know, I, like I did, a, I did a presentation this morning. I was up early. It was a group out of Washington, D.C. And I put on a nice blazer and a nice, you know, nice shirt and, uh, you know, my Nike shorts. Yeah. So that's why I don't stand up. And and as a result, I, I sit on my ass for a lot of my life nowadays. And then to get my to get my great cardio, I go on a stationary bike. I'm still sitting down. It's like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's really wrong here. So but anyway, good. thank you for standing and thank you for standing with us. Yes. So, uh, you know, the the conversation that I'd like to get into with you guys today is and we'll take this wherever it wants to go. But the nature of your work is is really collaborative. Mm. And, you know, I, I know that because I've been in, I've I've participated in it. You know, for example, when, you know, you guys and when the three of us together endeavor to write a, a song with with a group of people. 
that's purely collaborative. But then also the way you guys operate between each other, because there's two of you, you may have noticed. Uh, <laughs> so you, you live in, in a constant state of collaboration. And I, I know that, you know, for, for anybody nowadays, particularly, I was going to say particularly for people in business, but I think it's true for, for anybody, collaboration, teamwork, co-creation, these are words that we use a lot. But the, but the actual um, dynamics of it can be really challenging. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to explore, you know, collaboration in the creative process and elsewhere. So let's start out with, with the, 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 the collaboration between the two of you guys. Mm, yes, the space between, right? The space between. Well, you know, as you know, we're brothers and we've been partners in crime. And I think this is more important that we've been partners in crime um, in collaboration, partners in collaboration since we were kids. And we understand that's not rare, but rarer than, than having a sibling that you just see in, in, at Christmas, Thanksgiving and text mm -hmm. and have a great relationship with. So our whole career, we've noticed two reactions to the brother closeness. It's either people that say, wow, what's it like to be with your brother in partnership? And they, they ask that because they have a loving relationship with their sister mm -hmm. and brother. The other question is, so what's that like? <laughs> and what they mean is I haven't talked to my brother or sister that much since last Christmas. And, you know, we respect each other, but we don't, we're not close. So you find that the sibling dynamic, which was collaborative, like family is collaborative. So the sibling dynamic is our first collaboration or this first collaborative environment that we have to survive and try to thrive in. So we feel like we, sh whenever we show up in, and show our brotherly closeness, we, we challenge people or we inspire people. Mm. And, you know, isn't that the truth? We come as these creatures that are designed to collaborate in tribe together. And so I think we each are biologically hardwired to collaborate at first, even before we say, hey, let's collaborate. We're already collaborating. We're yeah, already I mean, I would go so far as to say, without collaboration, all you have is an idea. Hmm. So, you know, alone, we, we have these downloads, we call them, or, you know, aha moments, o OSMs. Um, and, and we get in the way of creative harm's way and suddenly something comes and who knows where it comes from. I mean, we could, ha we could, we could guess, but let's not do that. So, you know, it comes and then it's an idea. And then we, we have a choice. We can do the lone wolf thing and go to a cabin where everyone can leave you alone and you'll take that idea down the creative process, you know, as best you can. Or you have a group of people that you trust that bring out the best in you, that ask you questions, that give you feedback, that say yes and, right? And, you know, and so for us, the cost of not collaborating is much greater than the cost of the struggle of collaboration. And um, you know, so we are if we're kind of genetically encoded to collaborate because we're we're social animals, we're we're tribal beings, however you want to say it, oh. there's there's a counter programming that goes on in and maybe it's a it's a uniquely American thing. I mean, I don't know, or maybe it's a uniquely business thing. It's this um, zero sum game mentality that says that in order for me to be successful, I have to be more than or have more than be smarter than have more answers than the other person. Mm -hmm. So there's a reluctance among many business people or people in general to, to share ideas because they don't want to, they want all the credit. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have the whole of the intellectual property law, you know, set up to protect ideas from being stolen. Oh. Um, and it's only in the last <clears throat> 20 years or so that you've seen kind of, um, you know, open source uh, ideas where people share their ideas, knowing and trusting that other people are going to make them better oh. um, technology in the technology space and in the startup space, perhaps there's some oh. of that, but it's still early days for collaboration to be, the norm.
So you're talking about there's this new paradigm of collaboration in a way, and the old paradigm is more based on, and I, I'm so happy you brought that up, Steve, because biologically hardwired within us is the desire to collaborate, to survive and thrive, but also biologically hardwired in us is me and what do I need, mm. right? How much milk is for me left? Or, you know, how much am I going to get at dinner next to my big brother, big brother who's eating faster and more than me? So we're, hard, we're programmed biologically in both ways at once. And like, you know, this is clearly a passion of mine, like, you know, at the core of what I do with Isaac and in my world, whether it's voice music or anything else is really the desire to study human behavior. It's just my passion. And what you find is we're all sorts of confused biologically because we have these alarms that want to separate us and, and have us compare ourselves and compete with others. But we also have this system that wants to collaborate and create and actually trust that the best of us will show up when others with others in, a, in an environment of creating yeah. together. Right. So it's, it's in a way we have to somehow parent ourselves through one part of our biology to get to this other possibility of collaboration. So, so we have to go about it with conscious intent to be better at the collaboration, which I know sounds kind of obvious, mm -hmm. but in practice, it could be really challenging because isn't there, isn't there a tendency in most of us and maybe that's an unfair question, but isn't it a tendency, I'll ask it anyway, isn't there a tendency in, in most of us to, when we're working in a group, let's say, that when we offer an idea, we have an attachment to the idea and, and there's an ego attachment to it. In other words, that's my idea. That's my idea and I hope the group accepts my idea. Mm -hmm. And if the group accepts my idea, I want the group to say, Hey, this was far. This was Farbsy's idea. That's what I want, and I I think that isn't isn't that true for most of us? Don't we have that little yeah. bit? Or there's no or, need to judge them. It's the group. The group. The group did it. It's it was all of us together. That's what we well, say. we don't often feel that. Exactly. Yeah. I'd say let's just say that we all want at at the base core, you know, our child in in us, all want to be recognized for the value that we bring. And there's nothing wrong with that. Hmm. So, you know, how can we retain our individuality, our, our sense of self-worth, you know, but not be attached to it <laughs> and give into this collective space called collaboration? You know, that, that's, this, that's this beautiful magic. tension, this magic that we're kind of talking about. And, hmm. you know, not to answer the question, but one of the things we've lent on or, you know, what, one of the techniques we use partially just because we're built that way is specialization. And so if you go back to that tribal um, root of, of collaboration, you know, you had this interdependence, you know, you had your Smithy, you had your Baker, you had, and they were, that was passed on through family and generation. And so, you know, they all depended on each other to, to make what they needed to, to create a small community of people. So if you look at um, a community or a tribe as a creative engine or a think tank or a, a band or a company, um, <clears throat> then can, you know, what we rely on in a songwriting session, for example, is, you know, someone, someone kind of, we lean on that one person that might find the structure or the chords, so to speak. And then we might lean on one or two people to, to mine them for the melody. And then we might lean on a separate person who's more kind of left brain, logical, wordy to, to kind of lean on them for the lyrics. And, you know, and so we kind of bounce it around and, and give everyone a sense of equality, but difference so that everyone can be measured up mm -hmm. as valuable. And we don't expect necessarily the value to come from that one person or this one person. We're ready for a surprise. We're ready to be surprised. We love surprises, mm. but we're not attached to the outcome, but we also, um, you know, go to each person for their specialty. And, and it seems to work for that purpose. Oh yeah. Well, I, I just want to add, you know, what we're touching on here are the ground rules or the unspoken, whether it's unconscious or conscious, we like to bring it into the consciousness, mm. like the present conscious moment, ground rules of powerful 
collabor collaboration, which requires an agreement in a way. The agreement needs to be here in this space, in this idea, in this moment, for this idea, for this song, mm. um, or for this event we're collaborating on, or for this book we're writing together. Mm -hmm. That we set up ground rules where um, everyone is safe to show up two feet in, mm. share the best of their first creative impulse without judgment or attachment to it being used, liked, or acknowledged. So in our world, you know, with the songwriter's journey and our company, Your Big Voice, our, the whole spirit of our methodology is simple. It's dare to suck, you know, come home to this instrument that you've been given, which is this voice, non-melodic or melodic, dare to suck your first creative impulse idea and, and let it be shared into the, uh, the moment and let it be received as what it is and we may or may not use it. And so what happens when we show up with that kind of trust? And the one other thing I wanted to add is that it's not really about the I or the me, but it is about me as much as it's about you. So yes. when, we see when we see people truly showing up and collaborating powerfully, they come and they first go, okay, I am, and here's my idea. Mm. And as soon as their idea is shared, they hold the space of the moment mm. for others to do the same. And so what they're really doing is saying, I don't know what's about to come, but I'm going to look for the best in everyone on this team. Yes. And so often what's happening in society is we're taking people down instead of doing that. Yes. And, you know, and that, that is the, the phrase we like to say, yes. And what about this? And there's a one distinction that we like that might help, uh, you know, the listeners take in what we're saying is that, you know, how in, in the health world, they have the bad fats and the good fats. <laughs> so in collaboration, we've got the good ego and the bad ego, so to speak, right? To put it simply, the good ego is what Tara was saying, the I am and therefore I'm going to share this, you know, without attachment, right? The bad, the bad ego, that line is drawn in the sand at attachment, at the attachment to it being used, the attachment to it being liked, you know? And so really it's easy to find that line in us when we notice our attachment and it, it's easy, it's, it's easy to be attached. So let's just say that, like, it's, it's not a mortal sin to be attached. It's oh. very human. Can we, can we find that line and hold that bad ego, so to speak back at, after you, cause that first impulse that Toro was talking about, that's all good. That's all great. Yeah. You know, it's so the, it's what really, happens after. It's, it's holding two apparently conflicting realities or feelings or ideas at the same time. Yeah. Right. It's, it's I and we. Mm -hmm. So, so I think a lot of times people will, it, when they feel themselves being attached to their own ideas, there's a self, a sense of guilt that comes along with it because I feel maybe I'm not being a team player. And then, yeah. and then there's all this stuff that we're told, like, you know, one of my uh, all time least favorite cliches, which is there is no I in team. Yeah. Mm. Is, which is a complete crock of shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's literally true. There is no Z in team either. But, <laughs> but, but this idea, it's a crock of shit. The, sure. this idea that, that um, in order to be a part of a team, I have to completely subjugate my I-ness, my sense of self is, is, is wrong. I mean, every team is made up of a lot of really extraordinary eyes Yes. It just found a way to contribute to each other. So when you say, for example, uh, I'm going to dare to suck. The, the, the way I, I've seen that play out is it's both a concept as in just dare to suck. Let's just agree that we should all dare to have a bad idea, sound stupid, you know, what all the judgments we put on it. Let's just mm -hmm. dare to suck. That's part of it. The other part of it is actually using the words hmm. as in, and I hear you guys do this all the time, just daring to suck here. How about we dot, dot, dot. Yep. Yeah. So that is that holding the space that you were talking about, Torold, it, which is kind of, kind of an abstract term. So to me, holding the space means let me through my own action, through my own words, through my own approach, be a model mm. of what I would like everybody to do. So if I dare to suck, then 
Now it's your turn. You're going to be more likely to do that. Well well said. And think of yourself. I think it might be good to throw in a threat here for, you know, the business owners out there listening. Say you spend, you, you know, you're sitting in your boardroom, you're spending a million a year on, on your staff and you're sitting around the boardroom and you've got to come up with some solutions. It's 20, 2021 and things aren't the same, right? You need them all to be standing in their good ego, coming up with ideas on the spot, right? But they're all afraid, losing their job, of being embarrassed, of looking stupid, right? This might be a hypothetical. So, you know, what if they are all afraid to, to share their idea, to, st- to speak up, to stand out, to disappoint you for their idea not to be used? Think of the cost in terms of a non-collaborative space um, and think of the cost in terms of, you know, a whole team not willing to dare to suck and trust their first instinct for fear of all of the you know, insert fear here. So, you know, that cost is enormous and, and measurable. And very measurable. And I think you touched it, Steve, when you said, you know, to be a model, Right. And this is not just for CEOs and, and you know, leaders in whatever ecology that, you, that you're in. This is for every single person. I mean, 2021, I mean, this is a time where everyone essentially is um, of influence to each other. And every single one of us can model um, standing in, daring to suck, you know, saying, I am, here's my share. You know, this is my first impulse. Like, it's time for me to say this thing. And instead of inhibiting myself for reasons of, Um, inhibition or not wanting to, you know, you know, disrupt or all of these feelings we have going beyond that saying, Hey, uh, just, I just want to share this, you know, I'm just daring to suck here or insert a different way to say that. How about blah, blah. And with the freedom to share it without it being used, you're immediately modeling um, sharing and holding the space of collaboration. You're, Mm. you're, you're literally holding the space at the same time as, as, spilling melody into the space no. and then you're passing the space on and saying what do you feel mm-hmm. not what do you think of me but what about you here's the ball what do you do with the ball do you bounce it on your knee i'm interested to watch and yeah. be a part of this right so that there's a constructive way of being together that the world has unfortunately um lost over a number of generations mm. and it feels like it's more than ever a time to uh, pivot to this yeah. this new way of being together so I'd, I would uh, love for you guys to, to model that for us. And not so much in the, in the creative process itself, but an outcome from the creative process that you go through with each other all the time, which is all just a really fancy ass way of saying, I'd love for you guys to play us a song. Uh, well, while Todd gets the guitar, we're gonna, we're gonna try a song that we haven't played in a while just to kind of put us on the edge. But um, this one came down, uh, beautifully and and the chords came quickly and uh todd had this melody and we 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 talked about the meaning and we agreed that it felt like it was this story of um his late teacher jay atacama and we were right we we were there there wasn't really any lyrics really there were some placeholders and i looked at todd and i said and I think this is a really important part of collaboration is because we do need requests. And I want to talk to you about, you know, the power of requests and invitations um, in the collaboration, collaborative process. But I looked at Tarot and I gave him this really kind of serious look. And I said, I'm going to go and get and grab lunch. And, you know, so you've got 20 minutes. I'll, you know, I, I want, I, you know, I dare you to write these you know, the verse and the chorus, first verse and the chorus, um, by the time I get back, you know? And I think I, dare. and I think I went, I went like, <gasps> okay, that's a pretty good idea. I think I can do that for 20 minutes, you know? Um, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for we, the request. We, finished yeah. the, 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 we, we didn't finish the second verse until we we're about to record it, mm. you know, months later. So. Mm. All right. Here and we go. in the spirit of daring to suck, like Isaac said, we've played this very seldomly. It's a new song that's yet to be released. Uh, called Little Tears. And by the way, by the Brothers Corin, we we now officially calling ourselves. You'll be happy to know that France Francisco is no longer. We are transitioning back to ourselves. 
Ah, okay. So just just a, a, an editorial note. Um, so the brothers Corn, other brothers Corn, they've also been the kin. They've also been Francisco. They've also been Braves. They've also we'll put all we'll put all this in the yeah. in the notes so people can yeah. keep track. This so might this, be. Is a, this is a brothers Corn song we're about to see. dream last night you came back on November 8 I had a dream last night you came back to stay you sing of your bluebird country and we'd all hail hold in space into the night we'd never retire Till the firelight fades I was willing to fight on the day that you went away With all of my might I would have traded your place You sing into the wee small house and serenade songs that you loved like a horse with no name and amazing grace mm. come on broken in darkened days when tumbling hearts and little tears can't that be flood out it's unspoken the space you've made The quivering stars when dreaming on yesterday But where are you now? I never felt so close even though you're so far away I never dreamed that I'd choke when someone mentions your name did you see that white light coming for you that day? Or did you brace or leave for your life no longer deprived of freedom you craved? Beautiful song. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of things that that occurred to me as I was listening to that uh, gorgeous piece. First of all, when you guys just think back lo a long, long time ago, like several minutes, when you sang that song to us just now, mm. did that feel perfect to you? Not at all. Because, so this this is a really interesting uh, dynamic because it it sound it sounded perfect to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, may, maybe a little, I don't know, some maybe a little something, but you know, it sounded perfect. But to you, it didn't sound perfect. And so there, there's that's one dynamic. It's all relative, right? Perfection is a relative thing. It, is. it comes to creativity and art. But the other thing that occurs to me is when when I listen to that song 
And then I think about the process of creating a song or creating anything. But I just want to stay with let's stay with the song by way of example, but I think it's true in, in all dynamics. When I'm in the process of creating a song, after listening to a song like that, and I'm daring to suck, and mm-hmm. I'm struggling, and I'm flailing, and the words aren't coming out right, and the, and the melody sounds terrible, and, and then I have a tendency to think there is something wrong here mm-hmm. because I just heard that song, and that was perfect. Mm-hmm. In other words, what we do is we consume the final product, and we just kind of assume that it was perfect from the start, that it just kind of came out that way in, in, in one creative outburst. Or, or the, same, the same holds true if you read, you read a great novel and then you try to write something, you go like, this paragraph is crap. That person produced this incredible work of art. What we don't see is all the pages and pages and pages that were thrown away in, in fits of angst because it just sucked along the way. Mm. Um, well, I have so much to say back, but I want to touch on why I said not at all. And then, we, I, because what you're touching here is comparison, the dis ease of comparison in, within ourselves. But the first thing I want to say is the reason it was not at all is because the truth is Isaac and I were taking a really big risk singing that because we, we really don't have mastery over remembering how that song goes. So we were taking a risk on trying it. Cause I said, I don't think we're ready to sing that. Isaac was like, all right. And I was like, all right, I'll take that as a dare. Like, why, why don't we sing it? And, and so I just want to, I want to share this environment because it's a way of being with each other that, that I do, I'm really proud to say, not only are we a model of this way of being, but this is what we coach people to do, which is, can you be uh, almost ready and say, screw it and step in, in an environment where, you know, at least the, the gift of, of your experience will hold you to take a risk. And so many of us, brilliant people in their fields, forget that magic might occur when they let go of control. Magic might occur when they share an idea that's almost ready versus wait till it's an A plus in their mind. Because the truth is we're thirsty for real, not necessarily thirsty for perfect, right? Except perfection is in the behind the eyeball of the person experiencing it. Mm -hmm. But but what we wish, even the greatest, and we work with a lot of perfectionists, okay? I'm a recovering one. The perfectionist disease- It's a long road. They actually, you know, perfectionism or a true perfectionist actually doesn't love perfection in everything. Mm. When no one's looking, they also love what's and all. They just have, may have recognized it. So mm-hmm. the reason it was not at all is because it was a daring thing to share that. So. You know, we want to share that the part of collaboration is not being ready all the time, but being ready enough mm-hmm. to show up and share. I just want to say that first. And then to pass comparison back to you guys, what you modeled is about comparison. So if I'm getting ready for something and my first impulse comes out and I look at the first draft and I immediately move my being to look online at everyone else's finished products that's comparable, we lose every time that... Mm we don't realize that what someone is sharing is something that they've cultivated and curated or they got lucky and their first draft was just magic. And that happens to all of us. And the only way you get to that magic is trust. Um, so comparison, and I want to pass yeah. comparison to you because it's a disease in everyone we work with. To yeah, be absolutely. Um, bottom line is we're, we are incomparable and yet we're as a culture obsessed with it. And like Charles said, it is a dis-ease um, because it takes away all the ease of creativity, all of the ease of being ourselves and awakening to what's possible in the moment. And we start measuring ourselves against something that we'll never be. We'll never be that other person. We'll never sound like, you know, Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, like Tarot and I, no matter what we could do, um, to write like, and we have tried, we love, we love some Bruce, but we'll never have what he had. We'll never have his voice. We'll never have the life that he lived to get there. And like you said, you know, an, a work of art or any brilliant idea, a business idea, you know, that gets judged on the market, you know, you can't compare, you, you can't, you can't tell what it took to get there. And so all of that time is compressed and, incomparable so can we uh you know can we get back to collaboration and 
looking at the song, because that's our world here, you know, what happens is we'll we'll agree on some chords and then there's this there's this tender moment, right? Because there's a whole room of beings that are listening to these songs and you can hear, almost hear the melodies being heard. But who's gonna be the first to open their mouth? Right. right. Who's gonna who's gonna have the courage to go first? Yeah. Right. And embarrass themselves because really singing in front of others is is you know potentially always embarrassing if if we're willing to be embarrassed but isn't um, it also true among so-called professionals yeah 100 so, so when um you know recently you know the three of us had a conversation uh where i came to you guys and i said you know i want to i want to focus more attention on songwriting mm -hmm. and you know i've been writing songs uh off and on my, my whole life and the the um what you guys opened me up to was this reality that that a lot of songwriters write in collaboration with other songwriters. Mm. These are professional songwriters. And sometimes they're writing songs with people they've never even met before. And the way you described it, Isaac, was you said, and I quote, it's a series of awkward moments with perfect strangers. That's exactly oh, what that's it is. Great. Which is a great line for a song. And by the way, it's in the new song that I wrote with a friend of mine. That's fantastic. And, and you guys, in your inimitable fashion, turn that discussion around into a challenge for me. And you said, okay, your challenge is now you got to write, You've by the end of April, I think we said, you have to write seven different songs with seven different people. Mm -hmm. song. So I've, I've taken on that challenge. My point is that even for professionals, it's a series of awkward moments. It's a series of, of um, fear of being judged, of having a bad idea, even though everybody intellectually understands that's what it takes to get to the magic. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, Especially in the lyric department, because, you know, when, when we're writing lyrics, it's like very frontal lobe, very left brain analytical kicks in. It's easy to judge it. You know, everyone's afraid of saying something that makes them sound stupid you know, not just embarrassing and emotional, but sounds stupid and cliche. Like no one wants to come up with an idea that's cliche, you know, and I pride myself on just kind of, you know, I like to think that, you know, it takes one person to suck first <laughs> to say something, the first thing that comes into their mind and not filter it to then have that in the room so that other people get annoyed with it mm. because it, it disrupts their flow and, and then they're like agitated, irritated. And guess what comes out of agitation, irritation, disruption, you know, something, <laughs> something else comes out of it. And suddenly we're all fermenting off each other. And, you know, and then also, you know, being the fall guy or the first to fall, you know, someone can go, oh, yeah, not quite that. But what about this? Or yes. And yes, and. you know, and so you start the kind of dominoes yeah. falling. So it just takes one or two people to kind of dare to look foolish in the room. And, you know, I think that that's what we've found through our years of collaborating to song is we've found that there are actually creative types. And I would I would kind of hazard to guess that you and Torold are of similar type in that, you know, you are often talking out loud as you're figuring things out. And so it's really important that we record everything we say, you know, and, you know, you'll take something someone says and make it accessible and, and crystallize it, clarify it, embody it, you know, make it make sense. You know, and, and um, oh. you know, not that you don't both have brilliant ideas in, in, uh, in the inception. And you're also like, I would go to both of you for that kind of reflection, the yes and, you know, the exciter uh, kind of type totally. personality. So it's partially knowing your creative type. And mm. of course, we could walk through some of these, but to keep it broad, like there is clearly in the beginning of the creative process, there's the mess making. Okay. So there is first creative impulse, 
first idea, wow, whoa, something hit me. What if it's the first thing, right? Mm. And then someone goes, ooh, yeah, and what if we sculpt that what if into this? And that's what Isaac and I, Isaac's referring to you and I, Steve. And right those now. people are usually high mood, yeah. you know, high intensity, you know, performer types, yeah. you know, that just keep the ball rolling. And, right? that, and that's like an exciter and we can get into that. And then the idea moves to what we call framing. So you leave invention and sculpting and you end up in framing where you actually, it's still high mood, but you then frame out what it might possibly be. Now, this could be a book, a podcast, a song or anything, a company, a new what idea, beta yeah. testing. It's irrelevant what the thing is. It's, and at framing, it starts to frame, it starts to get a little bit more, objective and constructive and it starts to be like okay now let, what would the process be from here and then once it's framed we move to making and making is really objective a maker like a creative person that just loves to to just make the thing that everyone agreed on creating in the music world it's a producer or an engineer yeah mixer they're all maker types yeah and then just last to touch on it would be curation how do you curate and crystallize this into its finished ready um sharing Right. So we walk hundreds of people through the creative process privately or in groups. And, you know, I just want to also open up the fact that me, you and Isaac have been in collaboration with your big leadership voice, where we go in and tap the collective story and use song as a medium, a creative process to bring everyone in together and walk them through the mess all the way through to the curation. Um, and so this is, you can model this in song and it can be fractal and, you know, really, show up in every single thing we do together collaboratively out there in the world. You know, there's a really, there's a really um, compelling and powerful leadership principle, lots of them in, in what you guys just said. But one of them is this idea of, of being willing to go first, to, to, to make the initial mess. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself is a leadership act mm -hmm. that also runs counter to um to what a lot of leaders a lot of leaders think they're supposed to to do or to appear as and that is the smartest person in the room yeah. so on the one hand we say yeah leaders go first that makes sense you know model the way set the example but but then there's a reluctance if that example is one of being messy mm -hmm. because i i need to appear to be the smartest person in the room the person with all the answers. So I don't want to create an example of mess, but oftentimes that is the most powerful leadership act you can take. Because like you said, is giving permission mm. for everybody else to engage in that messy creative process. And we all say, we all say that we want to be more creative and be more innovative, et cetera. But to really create that environment where people are, are willing to dare to suck, make a mess, respond to each other, Leaders go first in that. So are you willing to jump into the mess as your own example? A hundred percent. I just, while you were talking, I thought of the love that it took, you know, a king, for example, you know, or, or, or a queen for that matter, um, leading her army into battle, right? Think of Joan of Arc. But it took the good ego, right? The selflessness, the non-attachment to the result to take out the front of the army and go first. Mm. It takes so much love for the, for the men and women fighting behind them uh, to be the sacrificial one, to ride out their front and, and valiantly to go suck. towards the enemy, which is not coming up with a solution or not finishing the song or, you know, but like, can you dare to suck? Can you dare to throw yourself into the mess. I'm not sure what love has to do with all this. I mean, that's pushing it a little far, you know. Come on, the love for the country. <laughs> Surely there's some more done. I was tracking with you until that stupid word. <laughs> you know, I wanted to say twice now I've thought of, I've thought of Oprah because, mm. and, and, you know, Brandy Brown's another example, but for some reason it's come up twice. So I need to share it that like, mm. what a defining example of like, like a power you know, royal, like leader in, in his greatest quality. And yet when you approach Oprah and her way she is being, she's curious, not fully sure, mm. wants to tap others, um, is real, is, and you know, the, the word authentic right now is every of it. The truth is 
she's she's modeling something different than the leader that you described, Steve. Mm-hmm. She's modeling a human being thirsty to journey toward making a mess and discovering the potential power of her experience and and to lead others in doing so. And she's been doing it for decades. Mm. And I think she's an incredible example of maybe what, you know, what leader um, can be. Inclusionary, yeah. Well, it's really one of the greatest um, ironies of leadership is that 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 expectation that I need to appear to be smartest, I need to appear to be perfect in order to lead mm. is, is diametrically opposed to what the reality is, which is um, the more I'm willing to embody myself, to be myself, to show my imperfections, to be vulnerable, the words that we like to use you know, nowadays, um, is is what creates a tighter connection with people. Yeah. Yeah. Human beings don't, we, we follow human beings. And the minute, and this is the irony, the minute somebody appears to be perfect, they're automatically suspect. <laughs> because we know there's no such thing. So, so that means, oh, you must be hiding something, which is why we love people who are real with us. Yeah. Because we can see they're they're not hiding something, and when when somebody appears to have a have a wall in front of them, a mask, a facade, uh, they're pretending, they're posing, as I like to say, um, we know that we're not seeing something. Mm. And when we don't see something clearly, we don't know really know what's going on. What do we do? We make stuff up. We start creating our own stories to explain what's going on behind that facade. <laughs> and, and that's that's the power in being real and vulnerable is I'm going to tell you my real story so you don't have to go around making stuff up about me. Let me just tell you what it is. That's right. And and if we could do that with each other, whatever it is that we're trying to create, whether it's a song or a or a business plan or or uh, or, or launching launching a new venture, oh. it's the same dynamic, right? Totally. Well, Without question. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to jump in and do something outrageous. So I'm going to dare to say, <clears throat> this is clearly not planned, everyone. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Isaac doesn't know what to do. So uh, let's model this with no attachment. So, um, okay. I'm going to start and pass on. Do what you love in the service of people. Do love what you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do what you love in the service of people to do what love what you do. I like that. The push comes to show. Do what you love. Your turn, baby. My favorite idea is yours, right? So you went, um, do what you love. And then you're like, cause love is just damn good business. Let's try that again. Do what you love. Cause love is just damn good business. That's a good one. There we go, let's do it again. I need to, I need to hear that again. Do what you love. There it is. Yeah. Love, yeah. love just damn good business. Oh, Steve Baba Business. Now, really quickly, really quickly, I started something. I, I kept looking at what's behind you. 
I felt blues. But you made it better. I started the idea. I totally sucked. Isaac picked it up, made it, made it into something, and then it got to you and you had the best idea. And everything, to us. And everything is okay. We all chose it uh, collectively. And then we brought it back and even harmonized it into a cool little moment. Um, if that's not a model, then what is? Yes. <laughs> Um, what the hell do you say after that? So, so then, you know, going back to what you guys were talking about before, there's the messiness, then there's the framing and the, and all that. So I'm seeing a frame around, around that, that includes, you know, it's the, you had the, the do what you love in the service of people who love what you do. And then that, that kind of a refrain because love is a damn good business. I'm seeing a combination of both of those things. Oh, nice. for sure. Nice. And then, and then maybe, and maybe something at the end, like do what you love, do what you love, do what you love, do what you love. Do what you love. or something, you know, His love is just what you do. section. <laughs> 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 Now, here's the thing. You guys do that kind of shit all day long, don't you? Yeah, we do. I mean, that's Sometimes we look at ourselves. We Steve, are guilty and, of that. And we're working on helping hold space and call in song. Because in the songwriter's journey, we help. Your, your, uh, your voice just dropped a little bit. Oh, okay. In, is that better? Yeah. In the songwriter's journey, we help, you know, someone fall back in love with the them that they are, fall in love with their voice, you know, fall in love with the music that's moved them. And then we kind of help hold a space for potential song ideas. So sometimes we look at it ourselves preparing for a client and we think, wow, we get to do this. Especially when it's a whole album and we have to kind of, you know, really, really dig in and, and dive into their cosmo musical cosmology, we call it, and their story. And we just, we feel very lucky and fortunate to have, have uh, been called to this work. Mm. And do you know, so go ahead. Because you know how I am. I like to make things very uh, succinct and, and understandable. You guys, the work that you do in large part involves taking other people, people like me, people, anybody that's got either a passion for music, maybe not even a, uh, any experience in music, but just has a passion for getting, getting some expression out and you work with them to create their own songs. Yeah. And find their voice, create their songs, turn it into something tangible, like a recording, and then share that with the world. That's the songwriter's journey in a nutshell. That's the songwriter's journey. There, there's two people now that we, the two kinds of people that we work with. That is one of the types. And then some people we found more recently don't want to write a song, um, but they just want to kind of open up their voice and free their voice and 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 get over the uh you know the fear of singing and um you know a lot of people are terrified to sing and for good reason because you know they've been shut down and and told they can't sing or think they can't sing or compare themselves to yeah. everyone else out there and um and so we create a safe space for for someone who just wants to reclaim their voice and hmm. sing songs that they love again you know yeah and maybe just model you know again the voice is something you wake up with and you go to bed with, and from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, you're constantly using it to either be amplified and share your voice or receptively listen to the world around you, whether it's your family or, or at work. So it's when someone falls back into the vitality, like that, like gets back into the vitality of their voice, and connects connection. and re-empowers it to it, something magnificent occurs every mm -hmm. time. So it becomes like, you know, voice is medicine, really. It, it shows up in your wellness when you connect back to it. So Actually, we're beginning our, uh, our second launch of our course called Reclaiming Your Big Voice late March. And um, if anyone's interested, please find us, brotherscorin.com. Please come join us. It Certainly, we created it for the first time. We created it for the that people person. that are terrified from either terrified or just plain nervous to sing, you know. So let me, I want to frame this up in the context of extreme leadership or leadership development, Okay. And here's, here's the way I would do it. So there's this dynamic that I often talk about that you guys know called the OSM, mm -hmm. which is spelled capital O, capital S, exclamation mark, capital M, which stands for the oh shit moment. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> the oh shit moment. The point about the, about the OSM is that 
it's the indicator that we're that we're leading. It's the indicator that we're doing something significant because there is no such thing as transformation or growth or leadership without that frequent experience. The problem is that most of us shy away from it. Mm -hmm. So the way that I typically frame it up with folks is this. If there's something that you've been wanting to do, maybe in your business or in in, in whatever context, it could be there's a, a difficult conversation that you've been wanting to have, but you haven't had it. There's been a job opportunity that you wanted to pursue, but you didn't pursue it. There's been a change at work that you've been wanting to make, but you didn't you didn't take any steps to change it. And if you ask yourself why, and the only honest answer you get back to yourself from yourself is because I'm scared to, then that's the reason to do it. So in other words, if the only reason you could think of to not do something is because the idea scares you, then that's the reason to do it. That's what I mean by the pursuit of the OSM. Mm -hmm. So having said that, for a lot of people, the only reason that they don't sing anywhere except in the shower where nobody, nobody can hear them or in the car where nobody can hear them is because they're scared to. Mm -hmm. It's the only reason. So if that is you, dear listener, <laughs> then the challenge is, can you then pursue, you love, you love to sing, you're scared to do it, you'd love to create music, you're scared to do it because you think you're going to suck. If that's the only reason that you're not doing it, that's the reason to do it. If you fall into that category, then you need to either work with the brothers directly or, or sign up for their program not just for the music, but to learn to learn how to pursue the OSM in every context. It's a great OSM generator. Yes, it is. And thank you. And, thank yeah, you, and yes, we, we can't wait to meet you. Be honored. And meet you in your OSM. Mm. You know, talk, about, talk about, you know, you look at the things we're most afraid of. And of course, you know, these, are un, you know, these aren't really logical fears, but, you know, fear of public speaking wins. Um, but have we really measured when you add melody to public speaking? Have we measured fear of public singing? Really? Because we have over the last six years and we have incredible evidential data. You know, we have so much data on what it means to invite someone into that OSM. And what we also have data on is what happens when they say yes, no matter how good of a singer they are, what happens to their lives, bodies, beings after they do it um, is so well worth the nerves. So I will, I will say that um, uh, I'm speaking from direct experience with you guys. Every time, it seems like every time I talk to you, you turn it into some, some new OSM for me. Uh, you guys have been mentors for me and my uh, re-enlivening of music in my life. And what you just described is that that's my experience completely. I mean, I am, I, I am very much at home in on stage in front of an audience of 10,000 people. I love it. Put a guitar in my hand and a microphone and say, now sing. I'm getting, it's getting a little less terrifying the more I do it. But oh my gosh, that is that that is that it's it's just terrifying and afterwards no there's no greater feeling yeah no greater feeling whether it was a flawless performance or not or something it's just that that human dynamic of pushing ourselves just a little bit further and creating therefore a new experience that we wouldn't have had otherwise Mm. And at the very least, we're going to learn something really significant about ourselves in that process. Absolutely. Can we can we request a song then? Uh, sure. I want. I just started hearing March Fourth. You, you people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that's one thing I never got to hang out. You know, we 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 love you and we love hanging out, but we never got to hang out as brothers. You know, with you and your yeah. bro. So yeah, let's, if you don't mind, would you sing him into, into the room? So, so let me, um, uh, yes, I, I will. I'll make a couple adjustments here with the, the audio and all that. Uh, and I also want to set the context for it. Mm. So 
and and when we're recording this uh, and and about when this this podcast will publish, will be right around uh, March fourth. Uh, so this is a, a song that's a tribute to my late brother Bill Farber, uh, who died on March fourth, hmm. and it was it was really quite an extraordinary uh, experience. I was I was there with him, uh, myself and other friends and family. There probably somewhere around 15 of us in the, in the room with him when he passed away. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a remarkable thing. I, I've never experienced anything like that. And he and I were very close and he always, he always loved my music. He was never a musician himself, but he was a great music fan. And I played music for him in his, in his final hours. And he was almost non-responsive to everything, but he responded to my music. He um, he just kind of did everything he could to move his head to just to acknowledge that I was playing. So I wrote this song uh, called March Fourth uh, to uh, to honor him, and I I don't play it very often, and so I'm I'm gonna get the lyrics up in front of me, and I will. Uh, you guys tell me if you can. So I'm not set up. Sounds beautiful. Mm, 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 mm. Okay. bell is ringing for you tonight your friends are singing for you tonight the band is playing every song you ever knew but didn't have the stage to perform but you knew all the lyrics since the day you were born Over there on the other side of time March forth, my brother, under the open sky Your next great adventure may be on the other side let me know when you get there I'll be standing by Send a text or a postcard Or one little flicker of a light And I'll be satisfied The fog is lifting for you tonight the past are listening for you tonight Your doubt is melting like an ice cube in the sun It's what you always try to realize With every breath you've taken since the moment you arrived Over there on the other side of time March forth, my brother Under the open sky Your next great adventure May be on the other side Let me know when you get there I'll be standing by Raise a flag on the mailbox a whisper in the night And I'll be satisfied I can't explain it, but it's true 
Look up, you'll see it too. The sun is setting like a Jew. And the moon is rising in the corner of this room. March forth, my brother, under the open sky. Your next great adventure may be on the other side. Let me know when you get there, I'll be standing by. Send a jingle through a wind chime or an emissary with a sigh. And I'll be satisfied. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So lovely, man. Indulging a, our request. What a song. You know, the last time I played that song was um, we were on a webinar together and you did that. <laughs> said, hey, play that song for us. And I hadn't played it in months. And I, I like in the middle of the song, I'm going, oh, shit, what's the next chord? I don't yeah. So I kind of had a little bit of that here. But it's a, uh, well, that was gorgeous. Um, Just one mic like that. Well, it's a, it's a thank you for modeling exactly what we were talking about and scaring the shit out of me. Yes. On the spot. I appreciate that. We've yeah. modeled a few things together today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, this has really been extraordinary, guys, as, as it always is. So brotherscorn.com is the the place to go to find you um we'll put whatever other links you want us to put in the show notes uh you've got your online program coming up and your music on the website for people that want to go down that uh you just just really catch up on all the great music that you produced over the years that's a great place to go for it you're also on spotify under the kin and all that other stuff so we'll, we'll put all that in there thank you um, and then, uh, of course, you mentioned earlier, I want, I want to be, uh, I don't want to let this go by without putting some emphasis on it. The three of us together uh, have this experience called your big leadership voice, where we go into a company, a team, a whatever, and from scratch, write with the group an original song together. Uh, and also explore the power of storytelling in both individual stories and capturing the collective story of the group through song. Uh, there's, I've just never seen another, I know I'm biased, but I've never seen another team building experience like this. It really is quite extraordinary. And, yeah, and the company gets to keep the song, right? I mean, the company yeah. gets to have a recording of their team song that everyone was co-writing and collaborating in. Yeah. So, yeah. You can imagine sitting down with your team and coming away with it, away from this thing with your own song that you created. And by the way, as you can tell, listeners from these guys these aren't cheesy crappy songs that come out these are really damn good songs so um yeah i guess you could tell i'm excited about it yeah please and if you have a company out there like take us up on it um and to learn more it's yourbigleadershipvoice.com i believe right steve right yeah we'll put we'll put that in the notes as well Isaac, Torald, Torald, Isaac, the brothers Corin, uh what a great pleasure thank you for being with us and um, hey, if you could take us out just by singing a couple of lines of, of uh, you know, love in the do what you do what you love in the now, yeah. now, now just sing sing one of uh, let's take us out with one of your songs. <laughs> All right, well, well you know, now we, you've requested two want, things. We kind of want that song. Do what you love, love. Uh, and we're gonna have to go back to in the podcast to find out <laughs> what the idea was. Lucky it's being recorded. That's the other thing. Always record your Always. creative ideas and name them. <laughs> do what you love. Do what you love. Do what you do. Some people that love what you do. Mm -hmm. Do what you love, do what you love, do what you love. In the service of love, service of love, service of love.
It's love is damn good business. What was oh, yeah. that? Cause love. Yeah. Just damn good business. <laughs> That's cool. Cause this is love. Woo hey. It's damn good business. Say it again. Let's go out with this. We say love. Thank you for listening to another episode of Love is Just Damn Good Business with Steve Farber. Join us again next time because when customer and employee satisfaction just isn't enough anymore, we are here to back you up with specific ideas to operationalize love to make an enormous difference in your business, personal life, and the world around you. Visit our website at stevefarber.com to leave a review. And don't forget to share the love with your colleagues and friends because after all, it's just damn good business.